We begin with the beginning of time because that is where we share a common ancestor. That's where we look at human origins where all human beings have a single starting point. And the reason we do this is because it shows we have far more in common than we do in difference, right? So our similarities outweigh our differences by a ton, especially to think about us in terms of our culture, in terms of our sociology and our psychology, the way our brains are functioning, the way our biology is put together, the way our cultures are designed, they all share a common starting point. And there's a reason that we share so many similarities today, it's because it goes back to that beginning story of where we came from. So we're gonna start with the very oldest parts of what makes human beings human. We go all the way back to our first origins, which is the Australopithecines. So these are pretty ancient creatures um, that live in the middle of Africa, Central Africa, um, and they are primates, they're apes, they share a lot of common ancestry with chimpanzees, orangutans, gorillas, and the like, right? These are our most ancient ancestors that we know of today. Now we measure these ancestors in terms of millions of years, meaning we use an old earth, an old time way of measuring uh, where our starting point comes from. That's not to say that young earth or other theories are not important or not valid or not meaningful to certain folks. By all means, folks are allowed to believe and think the way they do. However, in our terms, we use the academic standard, uh, the scientific standard for understanding time and how DNA changes over that time and our origins. So that's what we measure in the millions of years that archaeology gives us and science gives us. And so that's the methodology that we use. So millions of years ago, Australopithecines, our most ancient ancestors, were living in Africa. And over time, those Australopithecines became um, and evolved different species, right? And the way that works is that over millions of years, a species adapts, changes in response to the environment. It becomes isolated from other groups of the species. And over time, that isolated population develops into a brand new species of its own. And that is a separate group then from the origin group. So uh, hominids, that, that's all of the groups that are related to humans um, and, and the great apes spread out over time and throughout the world. Now, we are homo sapiens. We are anatomically modern humans. And we didn't appear the way we are today until around 200,000 years ago, give or take, right? But our ancestors, the folks that looked a lot like us, behaved a lot like us, go back for millions of years. Okay, so we can actually trace our origins through Homo erectus, who was around for several million years to about 140,000 years ago, and then Homo habilis, um, a, a group that came before those, right? So over time, we have changed into the group we are today. Now, if you look at anatomically modern humans today, a lot of folks will think, okay, well, we look very different. We have racial types, and ethnic types, and language groups, and geographic groups. And so we tend to look at our differences. But I would encourage you to see that those are actually not that different. Right? The variation in the human species really isn't that great. We all share a very similar color palette when it comes to our skin color and our eye color and our hair color, right? We're all basically tones of brown and really just different variations on brown. We have uh, the same for our, our hair color and for our eye pigments. Um, and although we get to blues and greens in our eyes, those are all kind of very rooted in the original color palette. So even the most distinct variations among us really aren't that different. A way of comparison, comparing that would be um, if you look at, say, like dogs, right? So dogs and wolves are the same exact species, right? So Chihuahuas, St. Bernards, uh, Great Danes, you know, Dachshunds, Yorkies, timber wolves, they're all Canis lupus, all the exact same species. And that species has great variation, it has variation in color, has variation in size. And we don't see that in humanity, right? Like we don't have variations in our color palette that we go beyond brown in our skin tones, right? We don't have greens or blues or anything like that, let alone like grays or, or those kinds of color palettes that you might see in like a, a dog family. 
We don't have great variation in our color of our hair. I mean, it ranges from blonde to brown, and really that's just a control of two or three different pigments. Uh, and so those pigments variations can mix to create the three color palettes that we really have. And really that's interesting because that's not a great deal of variation, if, again, if you think about other species. So we really are very similar when it comes to our ancestry. Now, what's interesting is that there were different species, right? At, at one time, there are lots of different human species on the planet, and there is great variation between us in terms of species, right? So if you look at us, anatomically modern humans, and you compare them to, say, like Neanderthals, one of our closest cousins, but also the archaic humans and the Rhodesian humans and the Deathsoven humans, and even the Florenzius humans sometimes named the hobbits. Great variation between us there. Also to Homo erectus, one of our ancestors who's around for quite some time. Um, and we actually have interbred with Homo erectus and Neanderthal and some of these other human species. Now, sometimes students will say, well, hang on, how can we interbreed with those folks? Well, here's what happens. We started with a common origin, that branched out, and then we isolated in different populations around the world, and then we came back and happened to run into each other. Homo sapien runs into Homo neanderthal, and because we shared a common ancestor, we're still able to breed. It's sort of like how horses and donkeys can still breed to make mules, right? Donkeys and horses are very different species, but they shared a common ancestor and so they're able to breed limitedly. Same with humans. And to this day, some humans, right, if you run your Ancestry.com or your, uh, you know, your any of your DNAs, uh, any one of those services, some humans will find that they have up to 7% of their DNA is Neanderthal, 3% might be Homo erectus. They have these other remnants within us because over time we ran back into these other groups. But if you wanna really cut humans up into very different versions, that would be by species, right? Like so Neanderthal, Homo erectus, us, very different. Racially within the species, not a lot of variation at all, actually. So um, it's almost kind of laughable to focus on those differences, race differences that we have today, when really we had far greater differences species-wise. Another comment is that at one point in human history, and not that long ago, only a few hundred thousand years ago, there were so many different humans running around that it was a very different kind of Earth, right? It was a very different kind of prehistoric world. In fact, it was almost like, say, like a fantasy world, like Tolkien's Middle Earth, or like the world of Game of Thrones, or Harry Potter, or The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, like these fantasy worlds where there are different races or, or species of human-like creatures, right? With like elves and dwarves and humans and all these other things, right? Or even like a science fiction world where like Star Trek or Star Wars have different species, but they're all kind of human-like. Well, not that long ago, Earth was the same way, right? We had Homo sapiens, Neanderthals, Homo erectus, Archaeans, Rhodesians, Denisovans, and even hobbits all running around the Earth, and they were actually different species. And so at that time, it was, there was a lot more variation of what it meant to be a hominid. So again, it seems almost laughable that we would spend so much time focusing on, you know, are, are you from you know, African or Eurocentric or indigenous origins? when really that's all human, all that's the same anatomically modern human. So when we're looking at this in terms of time, it becomes really interesting because uh, we human species, although have had a great mark on the planet, we really haven't been around for very long. And we also tend to think of ourselves in this really distinct way, like separate from the rest of life, separate from the rest of the planet. But really, we are just another species that's carrying on the genes and the energy and the matter that goes back for, you know, centuries upon centuries upon millions of years upon billions of years, right? So Homo sapiens and anatomically modern humans were descended from those early hominids. Those early hominids are primates and apes. Um, and those are descended from different mammal groups. Those mammal groups are from the vertebrate groups like reptiles and fish. Those vertebrate groups came from other life forms and similar life forms, for, and, and 
going through billions of years of life. And then where did life come from? Well, that comes from the origins of our planet and the origins of the planet come from the origins of the star systems, right? And, and those stars come from the very beginning of it all. And really that star, that energy that created all of the kind of snowballing effect of what the Earth was and all the other uh, planets and, and, and other systems are, carries through right so we're made of that energy that's our energy um and that's how we got to the to being right and we're carrying that on from generation to generation passing that energy on and, and really we're like just the the stewards of that of that energy so i always like to bring up the cosmic calendar which was which was a device created by a guy named carl sagan carl sagan was a um a scientist and a popularizer of science um in the late 20th century, so uh, through the 1960s, all the way through like the 1990s, right, right before he passed. And um, he thought it was important to show how much time has passed. And although humans have had a significant contribution to what life is and knowledge and, and communication, and these kinds of things, we've also only been here for such a blip, such a tiny little blip in terms of the entire cosmos. So what the cosmic calendar does is it takes the entire history of the universe, beginning with the Big Bang, and it breaks it down by a proportion or by a ratio to a calendar year, right? So sometimes students get confused by this and they're like, oh, the origin of the universe was on you know, January 1st. Well, this is just a metaphor of how much time and how the size and scale of things would work. Right. So at the beginning of a single year, right, if we use that ratio that, you know, 13 billion years ago, um, if the Big Bang happened on the first day of January, right, then the solar system and, the, and life as we know it doesn't get developed until September. Right. So so nine months later, that's when our solar system appears. So that's how long it takes for the Big Bang for our, for our star and our planet to evolve, right? And so this is really, you know, shows how much time there is between the Big Bang and our own star system and our own sun and our own Earth, okay? Remember, it's a ratio. So, you know, if you took billions of years and just turn it into hours, that's how long it would take from January to September to get to our solar system. Okay, then in October, we start seeing photosynthetic life, right? And in November, we start to see the very early kind of forms of eukary eukaryotic cells that become multicellular life at some point, right? So within the first almost full year, the first 11 months that we're talking about here, life is barely on the map and it's very, very simple. And then throughout, we start to see it become more and more complex. Right. So throughout the month of December, right, again, using that as a ratio, right? So only in the month of December do we see all of life that we know, right, as today, right? And that that month goes from multicellular forms to vertebrate forms, and from vertebrate forms, uh, that would include things like dinosaurs and the mammals and birds, but also uh, a parallel evolution with the, with the flowers, um, and then those kinds of the dinosaurs go extinct on December 30th, right? So we are now 30 days in into the last month of the year, and that's when the dinosaurs go extinct, right? Then on the final day, we have the dawn of the apes. We have our ancestors rising up. We have us rising up, right? The first cultures start to rise up. The first humans start to migrate. And it's not until the last hour, right, and the last... Uh, or I'm sorry, the last seconds and minute of the last hour that our civilization really forms. And it's not until like the very last several seconds before the end of the year that all of written history happens, that Columbus discovers America, you know, according to tradition, right? That, you know, all the religions are born and all these things happen right at the end of the cosmic calendar. What that really says then is that we have only been a culture, only been writing for a blip in terms of the universe's time scale, which is a pretty amazing thing to say because in one way, 
it's pretty insignificant. We're not really that significant compared to that whole length of time. But in another way, we've accomplished so much in such a short amount of time. So some of our most earliest accomplishments really comes from the art and the artifacts that we've created. And so the last thing I'll kind of end with is this idea that we left our mark you know, hundreds of thousands of years ago to about 50,000 years ago, we started building up to this point where we could leave our mark from generation to generation. And really it's through our art and through our um, design and through our ingenuity and our tool making that we are able to communicate from the past to the present day. And that's a really remarkable thing for our species, right? Because other species are limited to what they can communicate verbally or orally, right? So through their sounds, and through their behaviors, and through their patterns. But not humans. We have we have developed a way to con continue to communicate for thousands of years and for generations on generations. And so you can see here, there's a collection of cave art. And this is some of our, our most important and significant developments we have as a species, because this is the precursor for all of the other things that we eventually develop, right? Writing and uh, you know, the development of books and literacy and religions and philosophy and the record of history and our understanding of the natural world and even science itself all owe it to these uh, initial cave paintings and eventually petroglyphs and other pictographs that we create just a few thousand years ago, right? Like, so just from you know, 40,000, 50,000 years ago is when we started to do this, which is such recent history in terms of the entire cosmic history, right? Now, other things we also create that help test the, stand the test of time are things like Stonehenge, right? These massive earthenworks that cover thousands of acres, right? And people were doing these with stone tools, right? And, and nothing more than, you know, human force and human uh, energy, right? You know, this is for machines and for any kind of technology that really would have been it made these things easy so we're already starting to do this stuff in order to make our mark on the world and try to control and have some control over the natural world around us right and so you'll see in these cave paintings um you have these uh images of animals images of people's hands um there's a there's a this one right here is often known as the shaman right so it's a half human, half animal creation. So it's very imaginative, something that doesn't exist in the real world. But also these things are enormous at some times. Like this scale, just like Stonehenge with a giant scale, uh, the scale of cave art can span these massive kind of almost open, um, uh, huge cave enclosures, right? And they become these big murals. And so often people have asked, you know, so, so why? Why would we risk ourselves to do this, right? Why would we venture deep into a cave without electric light, right? So oftentimes completely blind, only using fire um, and, and very rudimentary materials, right? Like, you know, uh, clays and pigments that you got out of natural resources, vegetable matter and animal matter, right? So how, taking all these things and then going deep in these dangerous caves not knowing if you're going to fall off the edge or you're going to run into some, you know, predator or something along these lines and, and creating these massive murals, right? And, you know, we often think that the reason we made art back then is the same reason we make art today. We did it for, for symbolic purposes, for spiritual purposes, for decorative purposes, for creative expression, right? So we created art all the way back then and that art led to an understanding of the world and a record of the world, which led to other means of creating symbols. And those symbols became things like letters and sentence structures, mathematics. And we use those things to describe the universe, and record our histories. And so we, we've been doing this kind of work for thousands upon thousands of years. And it's a way that we humans try to take some, like I said, some control over the world. Now, there's some other theories that say that, like, the reason you represent something in a cave as a mural, right? So there's these, there's these horses and bulls and, and lions and bears, all the things that our ancient ancestors would have ran into. It's possible that you're 
you're recording that information for a religious reason or for a spiritual reason. Perhaps it's to try to capture the spirit of these animals. Um, so there's one theory where it's this is a kind of hunting magic, and the belief is that if you can represent the image on the wall, then you'll have good luck hunting that animal or be able to capture that animal when you go out on your hunts, um, which would be a very important part of our diets back then. Another thought was that when you represent these things, that you yourself then can possess some of the power and some of the, um, the, the uh, ferocity of these animals, and that when you go out, you'll behave like a lion or have strength like a bull, those kinds of things. But these are just theories and really just guesses because we really don't have any documentation to show exactly why we would do these kinds of things. Right? What we do have, though, is contemporary groups, like indigenous populations, say, in Africa and South America and Australia, who do similar things today. And we, we make some guesses based on what those folks are doing, that maybe we've been doing the same kind of thing for hundreds of thousands of years. right? And that's really the idea, is that we haven't changed all that much. We might have had more technology and there's maybe more of us, but the same problems and the same things that we're facing folks thousands upon thousands of years ago, we're still facing them today. We're still trying to understand what our purpose is in the world. We're trying to navigate our social circles, find mates, build friendships, survive, live comfortably, create some harmony within the world, right? These are the same exact goals that our ancient, ancient ancestors had, and we have them still to this day. So the theme between all of these ideas, and the reason we go back to the beginning, and just briefly, but the reason we do it, is to show that all of the cultures of the world, all of the people alive today, simply came from these people that we're looking at right now, right? We're looking at these cave dwellers and these people who use cave art to, to capture the, their beliefs and capture their society. And we are doing the exact same thing and we are just passing on that legacy from them. But we haven't really changed that much. We share a lot of similarity with those people, let alone the people across the planet. And it is the, the, the tiniest of variations that we see throughout the world that we end up focusing a lot of time on, but we forget the big commonalities that we all share. And sometimes looking at the origins and the common origins of everything shows us that yes, we really are very close related all across this planet. And so that's the goal, that's the message out of this very first lesson is that you can look at our origins, look at our shared commonality, and then everything we're gonna study from this point on right, be it religion, be it philosophy, developments of art, developments of culture, all can stem back to these original people, these early people that lived, you know, several thousand to a hundred thousand years ago. And we are simply carrying on the torch that they have passed to us. We are building upon the work that they did in order to be human beings that we are today. All right, so thank you for listening to this video. If you've got questions, as always, please reach out and take care.